Hello, everyone. Good to see you. I know it's uh, for most of us, it's a, it's a quite summery day. So I'm grateful that you are taking your time to join us in this fireside chat. More people are joining. Can anybody hear me? Yes. Hello. Okay. Hello. Good to have you here. We will wait a little bit for more people to join before we start. Thank you all for joining. I will um, start the presentation because we will listen to some um, beautiful guitar play from uh, John D. Liu, founder of the ERC. Can any, everyone see my screen? Can you see my screen? I can't see the screen actually, Inga. Maybe you can, oh, here we go. Yeah. yeah. That's great. That's great. Wow. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened, but I see more. And it's a really exciting day today because we're we're having the first camp from the Altiplano in Spain. The camp coordinator is going to share with us what has happened, what is happening now, and what's going to happen in the future. So we're so happy that you're here and I hope you enjoyed the music. I've been practicing a little bit and um, I'm always playing the same thing, but it's, it's starting to be interesting to me. And uh, the camps movement is growing. The official launch of the Ecosystem Restoration Decade was uh, launched by the United Nations. And uh, the camp movement's growing. And I hope you're enjoying it. And I hope we'll just keep getting better. Thanks so much for being here. Take it away, Inga. Thank you. 
you, John. Thank you for the and for your words. Welcome everyone to this fireside chat. My name is Inge Kerkhoff. I will be your host for tonight. And uh, today we have the fireside chat with John D. Liu, the founder of the Ecosystem Restoration Camps, and Sylvia, the camp manager from Camp Altaplano in Spain. Um, just some house rules. Um, please hold your question until after Sylvia's presentation. Uh, we want to make a little bit of an interact interaction Q&A session. So you can ask your question by raising your hand. Uh, there is a button in your Zoom. Um, you can click on reactions and then you see the button raise your hand and we will um, give you the opportunity to ask your question to Sylvia in person. Um, just for you to know, this session will last for about an hour, but feel free to stay for another half an hour or so because we will leave it open for an open discussion. So um, before we will go to Sylvia, I will uh, share some uh, camp news with you. Um, the camp experience. Camp Hotloom at uh, Mount Shasta in California will host a release party on the, the 18th of June until the 20th of June. So if you're interested or you're nearby, please go to our website and go to the event calendar and you can see, uh, see their um, experience there. Then Camp Coyote will host a free event from the 11th to the 13th of June. Um, so for them, the same, if you're interested, go to our website and have a look. Then Camp Creampop, who has been here uh, with us for the last session, they have the Eden Festival of Action from the 27th of June until the 4th of July. And just for you to know, Camp First Soleil and Camp Habiba in France and Egypt have an ongoing camp experience. So please go to our website to see if you're able to join one of these great ecosystem restoration experiences. Then Camp News. Um, camp People's Coast in Gambia, which is a seed camp, they just started setting up their first tree nursery. So we are very excited to see how that will develop. And camp Hotloom received 40 square feet of solar hot water panels for their showers and hand washing. Um, they are living quite remotely and have very little infrastructure. So this means that they will be able to host more people in the future. So um, I'm very excited about that. And Camp Versailles in France will be part of a French-German documentary about ecosystem restoration. Um, they have been picked by a filmmaker who received a grant to make a documentary about ecosystem restoration and they will be started filming in June. So I um, hope to see the results very soon. Then Camp Hatloom, Pachacuti and Paradise follows an infrastructure design course. And this really, they're, well, Pachacuti and Hatloom are more seed camp link, uh, camps and Paradise are more established, but they are really looking for, uh, to define their question, their how to, make sure that they will get the right infrastructure that they actually need so they can hope campers can host campers in the future. And then Camp Baby Pola began a project to introduce orchid plant structures into the analog forest collection. Uh, Sri Lanka is known to have 199 orchids, including 55 endemics, and they just started a pilot to introduce them into their analog forests. So uh, we will keep you, keep you updated about this news. Well, then we are going over to uh, the guest of tonight. I uh, asked Sylvia to send over a, uh, some drone footage for us to see what the site of Camp Altaplano looks like. Personally, I have never been, so I'm very curious what Sylvia has to share. Um, but they are situated in Spain, in Murcia, and it's, uh, the camp itself is five hectares and it's a plot in the middle of the 1500 hectare farm that is transforming from a biological farm into a regenerative farm. And they are, one of, they are our first ecosystem restoration camps and are working now for over three years. And they are the first camp that also collected some data. So I'm very curious how things have been developed. And um, without further ado, I think it's uh, good to ask Sylvia to, um, if she can start her presentation. She, um, 
asked me if she can share her screen herself. So I will be stop sharing. Let's see how that works. Yes, and we can bring it back. Welcome, Sylvia. Good to see you. Hello, thank you, Inge, for the nice introduction and John for the music. And it's really nice to see a lot of faces. Some of them I've seen before, and that's also really nice. Um, I'm going to start sharing the screen. If anything doesn't work, just unmute yourself and let me know. And you should be able to see the screen by now, if I'm not wrong. So this is going to be a bit of a story about um, what happened uh, at camp since the beginning and indeed what's happening now, like Inge already announced. So we're gonna talk a bit about the buildings at camp, the earthworks, so everything related with rainwater harvesting in the ground, uh, the management of the ground cover, which is kind of the core of what's happening at camp, uh, the agroforestry system and the reforestation efforts. Where are we located? Um, we are more or less in the area of Spain. So it's the, yeah, it's the south of Spain, but inland. We are on a plateau, so we are at 1100 meters above the sea level, uh, which makes it a very special place because it's a Mediterranean climate. We are in the south of Spain, but we're also very high. Um, so we have um, really hot and dry summers, but we also have really cold winters. It snows every year, um, many, many days of frost and a lot of wind which makes it very harsh conditions for, uh, for agriculture. Um, this is a satellite image of the area of camp before it was camp. So as Inga said, it's an area of five actor um, in, in this semi-arid plateau at 12, 1100, 1200 meters above sea level. We have very little rainfall, maybe yeah, between 250 and 350 per year. And it used to be uh, a cereal field. So we are inside the farm of La Junquera, which is a larger farm, which is now a regenerative farm, uh, which has turned from being fully a grains farm, cereal farm, to a diversified one. And camp is part of this whole process. And here is an image of the design that was done. And it's kind of showing um, almost everything that is happening at camp at the moment. Uh, so we have an area with ponds on the left side, which is um, a riparian area. And we've been working with um, planting native species in that area and keep it as a natural area. Uh, there's swales that are crossing the whole area to harvest rainwater. And there's the agroforestry system with the core um, crop, which is almond trees. And then you see all the different buildings which I'm gonna show you more in depth. Um, so when everything started in 2017, there was nothing, um, uh, as you saw in the picture. So the volunteers that started here uh, had to not only work with, not only work the land and prepare the land, but also create a space for them to be able to live there and to even just to have a snack and some shade while they were working there. So on the left side, you see the kitchen, which is made of uh, wood cob and straw bales. And on the right side, it's what we call the roundhouse, um, which used to be a shelter for shepherds possibly. So it was uh, a building in ruins, which has been fixed with stones and also straw bales and cob. And here you see the roundhouse as it is today on the right side. And on the left side is on the left side it's the second building that we have to host people, which is a space for six to eight people uh, in a shared uh, dorm, and it's uh, also made of straw bale and and it's covered with a canva. And we this winter we installed a fireplace and a new roof, 
So it's very well insulated. It keeps really nice the heat in winter and, and it's great that finally people can stay over at camp even during the winter. Uh, one big problem that we had there was that there is no water, but we just finished building a water deposit that currently we're filling up with water from, from the farm, which is four kilometers away from camp. Um, and the idea is also to install rain gutters and, and to be able to harvest the rainwater from the buildings. And then the earthworks. You see here, again, a picture of Kemp and the arrows are indicating the direction of the water flow. So the slope basically of the land. Um, and the idea of the earthworks is basically to, to use uh, all the water that you get throughout the year and store as much as possible in your land. Um, as I said, we have very little water and even more problematic is the fact that it's mainly throughout a few months of the year, uh, more or less between October and April or May, which means that all of the summer months, uh, there's no rainfall and everything that grows here relies on, on rainfall. So, the idea of um, the swales and the ponds, you see on the left side, three of the ponds, and now there's two more that have been dug in 2019. And you see, if you can, I guess you do see my arrow, and then you see these are the swales. So it's trenches in the ground that collect all the rainwater and redistribute it throughout the land which means that indeed we have an increased uh, infiltration of water, uh, which means that the groundwater table can rise and there's more humidity in the soil, more water available for the plants. And this is um, just to give you an idea of what you can think of when you work with, with your land, with, with the rainwater and harvesting. This is a map um, of the broader catchment, which means you see this red line here and the dark green line here is the line of the ponds. So this area is more or less the area of camp. Um, and this map shows that basically all of the rainfall that falls in this being in the inside of the green line is ending up eventually here at camp uh, because of the slopes. So of course uh, it doesn't all end up there because there's infiltration, there's plants, there's evaporation, but these ponds have been built because they can collect actually a lot of water from the broader catchment. And this is the design of a swale. Uh, on the left side, you see what's, what's the idea of it. So we have um, a slope and a trench that cuts perpendicular to the slope. And you can take advantage of this area to plant a variety of things because think of, for example, you have a cereal field and then you dig a swale, you're losing land that it's not arable anymore, that you're not, where you're not cultivating grains anymore. Um, but what does the swale does to my harvest? That it decrease, decreases the profit vulnerability to droughts, which means that I might reduce my harvest in a way because the surface that I'm growing, it's smaller, but at the same time, because I have and increased water infiltration in dry years, my crop is gonna do better. In addition, you can plant, uh, as I said, different things. At camp, we have planted on the inside of the swale aromatics and native perennials, such as rosemary, santolin, and lavender, uh, and also shrubs and small trees that are good both for pollinators, for birds, um, like junipers, getama, black author. Getama, it's also a nitrogen fixer and white pistachios. Um, so that the trees on the opposite side can take advantage with deeper roots of the water, which is sinking deeper, and the bushes the, the, and the aromatics, which are smaller, uh, can access the water more easily. The ponds were, the first ones were dug in 2017, and they are now impermeable just thanks to the clay, which is in the ground. In, in the soil of the area, it's very, it's very high in clay. Uh, so throughout time, basically, there has been a layer of clay covering the bottom of the ponds, uh, which made them impermeable. They're currently 
quite low in water. And what we think is um, probably because this year we hadn't had any, any heavy, really extremely heavy rainfall. Uh, so the idea of the ponds is that they fill up with great rainfall events. This year it has rained quite a lot, but more spread out throughout the year. And this pond here that you see in the picture is the biggest one that we have. Uh, and then there's five more, which are smaller and two of three of them have water throughout the whole year, uh, while the last two are basically drying out in summer and filling up again in winter. Why the ponds? Uh, in terms of biodiversity, it's been a massive change. So I'm here since uh, a year and a half, more or less. So I haven't seen the difference at the beginning, but I do see the difference between this area and the farm and other areas where there's no water. So there is an increase in the amount of the richness of plant species. Um, there's also an improvement in the soil because thanks to all this biomass um, around the ponds, there's an increased soil stability, water infiltration and nutrient cycling capacity. And also the plants around the ponds can establish deeper root systems, basically allowing for more plants to grow deeper and to uh, be stronger in periods of drought. Also, we see loads of animals uh, around the ponds. Uh, there's loads of frogs, uh, snakes, birds of all kinds coming to the pond, foxes, wild boars, deers. Um, so it really creates a it's a focus for biodiversity. It creates a new habitat, basically. And then we moved on to, um, well, the volunteers that were here at the time moved on to work in the soil to break the compaction. So you see on the left side, there's a picture of um, a soil profile of camp where we see the first maybe 15 centimeters of really nice and soft soil. And then after that, a layer which looks like um, rock, basically. Um, this is caused by the work of machinery. With a uh, tractor, for example, you go and plow the land, you soften and aerate uh, and oxygenate the first 20 centimeters, but below that, because of the weight of the machinery, you're creating what is called the hard pen. So a layer through which roots and water and air cannot uh, pass making it very hard for the plants to grow. Uh, so what's been done is um, with a machinery called a deep reaper, uh, which is more or less like this. Uh, this is the yeoman's plow that is designed exactly for this purpose. So it's basically knives that cuts the cut through the ground and don't turn it, don't, don't lift it, don't try and put upside down everything which is in the ground, but just create a cut through which roots, water, and air can infiltrate. So breaking, slowly breaking this compacted layer. And then uh, they spread compost on the whole area of camp. In a part, it was uh, manure, animal manure. And on another part, it was pellets. So it's basically the same, but it's dried out. So it adds the same uh, type of nutrients, but you don't have the same texture change in the soil but also it's much more expensive. So that's why only on a part of camp it was spread out. And then a mix of cover crops, 30 different species, uh, mainly um, cereals and nitrogen fixing uh, plants, leguminous like vetch, for example, and peas, um, because they function together very well, the nitrogen fixers are making the nitrogen available for the other plants that are growing, like uh, like wheat, for example, which has a deeper root system, a root system that is more capable of breaking this compacted layer in the soil. So basically you create a symbiosis, which works very well. And all of the other species were also thought for different purposes, for example, species that are good at attracting pollinators. Um, this year we have been um, adding compost. Uh, we haven't been adding compost to camp, but we've been experimenting with compost teas and with urine uh, because we have uh, compost toilets for the volunteers, uh, which means that we separate pee and poo and uh, the poo for the moment is still there. 
And what we do with the piece is that we dilute it one to 10 with water, and then we, we use it as a fertigation, so fertilizing and irrigating the trees at the same time. And then moving on to the management of the ground cover, the idea is to keep a permanent ground cover to protect the soil, to avoid erosion. Um, and the, in 2019, they, experiment, they brought in sheep from, uh, from a shepherd that works here on the farm. And last spring, we brought cows to camp that stayed more or less for two months. In the map, you can see the areas through which we moved them. So we couldn't put them where we have the trees because they would eat them. So it was only areas uh, without trees. And we were moving them with electric fences every mm, three to four days, depending on the size of the area, depending on the amount of food they had. And we, so this was from April until June, more or less. Uh, so that then we had the whole period of summer with a, um, the soil left after the cows, uh, kind of uh, bare. And a girl that came here, Nerea, she came here in September as a volunteer and she did, and she did a study about the effects of the experiment with the cows at camp. And she basically saw that on most levels, um, the nutrient cycling and the, and the soil health was better in the areas that were not raised which actually makes a lot of sense because summer the soil is left kind of bare. Uh, the manure from the cows doesn't receive any rain, so it's not really processed by um, the biological activity in the soil. And it kind of fossilized on the ground and stayed there. Um, so our idea is now to try actually in the end of the summer, maybe with a horse or maybe with the cows again. Um, but the good thing, for example, is that the plant species that were growing in those areas, there was much more variety in the areas uh, grazed by the cows. So different impacts, different results. And then the agroforestry system. So as I, this is a, a scheme of what the agroforestry system looks in a part of camp. You see the green dots, which is the core crop, as I mentioned, it's almond trees because it's a crop which is uh, grown in the area. Uh, loads of farms are growing almond trees and it's uh, drought resistant, it's adapted to the region. So the idea was to create a system that uh, makes sense in this area and that takes what is already existing and adapts it to what we want. So the core is the almond trees, then in, there's this tree which is called black locust, which is a nitrogen fixing tree, uh, which is planted uh, more or less every four almond trees. And the idea is that it produces biomass and being a nitrogen fixer, the biomass can be reintroduced in the soil and act as basically fertilizer. Then there is a few, in the areas without the black locust, um, there were planted shrubs, which are also nitrogen fixing shrubs and are existing in the area, well, are native species. And then you see these lines in between some of the lines of trees. And these lines are aromatics. So we have uh, lavender, thyme, uh, and rosemary. And the idea of these lines is that they are alternate so that in the moment you want to come in the field with a tractor, for example, to harvest the almonds or with the horse to cut the grasses or whatever, uh, you can still act on the trees uh, without, uh, without damaging the aromatics. And in the plant, there was also a chicken tractor. We've had one for a while, the fox ate the chicken. So now we are in a bit of a break from the chicken tractor. We don't want to feed the fox more chickens. Uh, we have a few turkeys at the moment at camp that just, they were gifted to us. So we'll see if um, we can have a turkey tractor. This is how the system was planted um, in a part with an excavator and then the trees were planted by hand. And in other parts with this um, machinery that you attach to a tractor that basically digs a trench. So you just put the trees inside, step them down to avoid air pockets in the roots. And it's a, it's a quite effective and efficient way. 
Now we're working a lot on the vegetable garden, which was started at the beginning by the volunteers and that was kind of abandoned in the period of no volunteers here at camp and the change of management. Uh, we're irrigating it with the water from one of the ponds, which is pumped up with a solar pump. And then by gravity, just flows to camp with clip irrigation. And um, we have experimented with microorganisms reproduction, compost teas, and no teal in the vegetable garden. And then there's this part of fruit trees that we have where we take advantage of the wastewater from the kitchen, which is diverted into different pipes and it spreads out through uh, different branches so that it can water different trees. This is a quince. And what you see behind, which is a pellet, is, uh, was made by volunteers that were here in January with the idea to protect the trees from the wind. Because these trees that we planted in this area are a bit more delicate, are more delicate than almond trees. They're Mediterranean, but the cold might be a problem for them. That's why we build some wind protections for them and we make sure that they have enough water. And then the reforestation part is a, a big part of our work. You see on the left, two different areas where we've worked on the farm. One is a scrubland basically, uh, very dry. And what you see below is the area in between the ponds. So it's a more humid area. Uh, there's the groundwater level is very high, very shallow. So uh, we planted different species in those areas. And on the right side, you see more or less where they're located on the farm. To select species, while we, when we work with reforestation, we try and look at what's existing in the area. So we take a reference. Here on the farm, there's a Mediterranean pristine forest uh, with loads of oak trees, junipers, rosemary. So basically we're only working with these species that we already find here. And we, the majority we get from a nursery, a local nursery. And we are starting to try and propagate some of the plants some of them uh, through cuttings, for example, um, tamarisk. Some of them we do direct sowing, like the acorn, which um, is actually quite good to work with direct sowing rather than plants from a nursery because of the root system, which develops straight and deeper if you grow from directly from an acorn in the soil instead of taking the trees that come from uh, trays from a nursery. So here you see, also that we tried to work with different levels so that we create, we bring in the system all the different layers uh, up to the climax, which is the pine and the oak, uh, the climax vegetation, but we also try and create indeed a complex system that has all the different layers. And these are the species that we planted in the wetland area. Uh, so it's ash, uh, poplars, willows and the tamarisk. And here it's also in the different um, type of trees, different growth, different heights. And what we want to do also, and what we've been doing uh, is not only working on these five hectares of land and within the farm of La Conquera, but also collaborating with different farms in the region and um, basically be kind of a hub for volunteers to come here, uh, learn about landscape restoration, ecosystem restoration, and then help farmers in the area that maybe have the land, maybe have the interest in working differently and in doing reforestation work, but don't really have the money or cannot or don't have the hands, enough hands to do this. So this year, for example, we have worked in three or four different farms. Here we were planting pine trees and um, which is a wild uh, pistachio on a farm which is an hour away from here with Antonio Marandi, the man in the picture. It's his family farm and he basically, it's mainly an almond farm, mainly almond trees. And he's already been working on creating ponds, on doing reforestation efforts. So it's also really nice for people that come here to go and see other farms. And it's always a really nice moment of sharing and creating together and uh, expanding the horizons 
from what we have here. Um, this is, um, I think, nice to look at this in the way that it shows us everything that's happening at camp in a very visual way. So I'm trying to keep a record of, I don't know if we can access this link. Yes. I'm trying to keep a record of everything that we do at camp in the different areas so that um, we can understand better um, the impacts of soil management on the land. So different management on the land. For example, here you see, um, as I mentioned, um, there's a part that has been during the first year, there's a part that was fertilized with manure directly and a part that was fertilized with pellets. You see the green areas have been fertilized with manure and the red ones with pellets. And then we can look at, for example, the organic matter content uh, that we, we took samples last autumn and we sent them to a lab. And we see that in different areas, we have different uh, contents. Red is the lowest and blue is the highest. Uh, so you can really see that the uh, areas that have been, for example, that have received pellets instead of manure, there's kind of a difference. Then we have the red area, so the lowest content which is what we call the control area. So we're not doing anything in that piece of land. We're just keeping it as a reference to see the differences. And then you clearly see that the area of the ponds where we left the natural vegetation growing, we haven't worked with machinery at all. We've now been working with reforestation. So replanting is the one with the highest organic matter content. Of course, also the one with the, with the highest moisture content in the soil because of the location. Uh, but just this is a very nice way to see visually what's happening. And for example, areas where we spread the compost tea. So here, which is the area behind the kitchen where we have the fruit trees. Um, and I think it's a very helpful tool to, to see what's, what's happening and why. Let me go back to the presentation. And what we've seen with uh, everything that we've been doing until now, um, as Inga mentioned, this has been, um, well, here at camp, there have been studies already since the beginning, so since 2017 and 18, um, to evaluate the state of the land. So here you see the organic matter content uh, of samples that were taken in 2018. Uh, again, it's uh, in colors, so the red is the lowest, yellow is a bit higher, and green is the highest organic matter content. And this year, well, last autumn we took samples again, and you saw on the previous map all the different areas. But you see, if we compare the same area, we have overall an increase in every area, we have an increase of organic matter content. So in this sense, we know that definitely has, uh, there has been a change and an improvement. Uh, now we're working on the monitoring fr framework that the foundation has developed so that it can be applied to all camps. Um, we don't have results yet, but we've seen, we've done the water infiltration tests we have just set the uh, T-back test to see the composition rate so that year by year, we can keep an eye on, on the differences and what's happening. And I would like to leave you with these images, which are satellite images of the area of camp. The first one on the left is from 2014. So, and camp started in 2017. And on the right, you see a picture from 2019. They're both from the month of August. And I think this picture says a lot about what's happening there and the input of everything that's that we're working with and the efforts of all these years. 
So this is it. And I think we have space for questions. Thank you, Sophia. Applauding for all the work. It's amazing to see indeed. What a transformation. Thank you so much. Yeah, John. thanks to all the people that have been working here since the beginning and all the volunteers that are here now. It's it's really nice to have all these people coming and going and bringing in their work. I can imagine. Probably not a day is the same. No. <laughs> no. Great. Excellent. Does anyone has a question for Sylvia? I'm personally curious, um, what, what has been the biggest challenge for you since you've uh, been at Camp Altiplano? I think first understanding what's happening here, because <laughs> there's um, a lot of things. Um, Well, the fact, I think the fact that it's a, a very uh, complex uh, project where there's many things happening at once. On one side, uh, the, the management of the land, on the other side, the management of the, of the volunteers, the infrastructure. Um, so I think the fact that you need to manage a multitude of, of issues and also, for example, the fact that we, or at least I would like to avoid having any machinery going on the land, uh, but it's still, it's five actors, so it's still quite big, at least for me. Um, so indeed, without the, the, the hands of the volunteers, it would be impossible. Luckily, they are here and they come and go, but it needs, so thinking of ways to work on the land, uh, that involve no machinery, but they're also possibly not destroying the back of everybody which is here. I think that's quite a big challenge. Okay, thank you. Um, I see Michael Polarski raise his hands for a question. Yes, uh, Sylvia, wondering if you are using any mineral fertilizers, mineral amendments, uh, uh, you're using organic matter amend amendments, but but uh, minerals. Um, ashes. That's the only minerals we've been using at the moment. So the the manure that was spread uh, during the first year was basically um, animals manure and and husks, rice husks. Is that you call it? Like the peel of the rice. Uh, and the pellets were also from uh, animal manure, simply dried. And this year, for example, with the compost tea, what we use is compost that we're making. Uh, so it's, it's all organic matter, there's no minerals in there. Uh, molasses, uh, ashes, and, um, and I think that's it. So ashes, in a way, are the only minerals that we're using. And the land here, it's very high in clay and it's also very alkaline. Um, so I've been looking, I don't know exactly what you're, what you're thinking about, but I've been looking at a few things and it seems like in this type of soils, um, it wouldn't be, but I guess, yeah, you can look for the appropriate one for your land. I don't know if you have any advice. Well, do you have, a, have you made soil tests that you could send me a soil test or several from the place? <clears throat> yeah, we have, have them. Advice. Yeah. That would be really nice. We have them from 2018 because uh, the tests that we did last year were only about organic matter content. So we don't have an evaluation of uh, minerals and components in the ground. But I guess it probably didn't change too much from 2018. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. If you could send me that information or put it on your site somehow, uh, the soil test. That might, yeah, we might test. Myself Thank or you. others have ideas. That would be great. Thanks. Great. Thank you. I see, I see a um, question in the chat from Louise Fett. How is the response of the neighboring farmers? Um, 
So the, the closest neighboring farm is uh, Alfonso, who's the owner of the land, and he's the one that agreed on starting this project here. So that's a quite positive <laughs> response. Uh, but I think that the nicest, the, well, the nicest, the, the most interesting response is the response of, of people that uh, work on the farm. So like tractor drivers and uh, anybody that has been living in the area since forever and has always seen a very different type of agriculture. And many times they come there and they look at the land and like, Silvia, what are you doing here? We're gonna take it all down. Look at all this grass growing there. It's full of stuff. <laughs> it's not good. And, and one time the guy from Tampa, they came with the tractor to do the deep reaping. So it's breaking of the soil. Um, he was saying the same and then he started working the land. He looked at the soil and was like, wow, it's actually really nice soil here. So that was, I think, a really nice contact with these people that from the outside, they look at it and I think it's kind of madness because here there's this culture of uh, plowing very often, having the fields very clean uh, to avoid the competition of plants in summer, which is indeed a thing also partially. Um, but then indeed, when they look at the soil and they see that it's doing much better, I think there's a, there's a bit of thought there, maybe, hopefully. Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Interesting, thank you. Uh, Rob Wheeler. Thank you. I'm Rob Wheeler. I represent the uh, Dulles Network at the United Nations. I have a number of questions about the uh, logistical uh, labor uh, parts of the project. And thank you first, this is fantastic presentation and a uh, wonderful project. Uh, my first question is how many people, volunteers you have working there on average? Are most of them long-term or short-term volunteers? How long do they stay? Do you have any compensation for the volunteers that come? Uh, what's a budget cost to run a project yeah. like this per year? And do you have a farm manager that manages uh, both the restoration parts and the uh, growing parts of it? Thank you. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm here since a year and a half. And the first six months, we have had barely any person uh, because it was a hard lockdown. Um, so there were basically two volunteers in total for six months. And, but since September, we had a more of a constant flow. Um, and uh, let's say from two to, two to six volunteers, depending on the, on the moment. Um, I would say that most of them are staying for two months on average, but then there's also some people that come for three days or a week. And there's one guy, Gabi, who's been here now for I think nine months probably. Uh, he has also a side project, which is actually his own project on uh, communication about regenerative farming more to young people. So he's living here and, and he's, he's permanently at camp, which is really nice. Um, we actually ask for a contribution from the volunteers that come, uh, which is something I would like to, to change. So we're looking now into the possibility of uh, of of entering the it's not called anymore European Voluntary Service, uh, but this uh, European Union program that basically uh, gives pocket money to volunteers and also money to the project so that you can keep running. Uh, with because we're calculating that more or less with like cost of the gas for the car. Uh, the maintenance of the buildings, uh, the gas for cooking, the, everything, the materials, it's probably around 300 euros a month to have a volunteer um, with us. And at the moment, we're asking a contribution of 100 euros. Uh, 50 is going to camp and 50 is going to the farm of La Junquera because they are also using facilities in the farm. Um, but yeah, so hopefully this will change. And farm managers, you were asking um, for camp for the for for the area of camp. You mean who's managing the whole thing? No. Yeah. yeah. 
So at the beginning, it was a group of volunteers. Uh, I think it was around seven people. Uh, they were, um, most people were here for more or less a year and then were the short-term volunteers swapping around. But since last year, um, they've decided to change the management. Uh, so they hired me and I am the only person who has a paid position uh, to run the camp. Um, I'm supported by Alphonse and Nick, who are the owners of the farm, uh, by other people on the farm and by the volunteers. Um, but I'm managing everything from the volunteers to the agricultural part. That's why it's complex. <laughs> Thank you, Sylvia. I can imagine that it must be complex. Lots, lots of work. Thank you. And exciting. And exciting, yes. Yes. Um, Faye, would you like to ask your question? You are muted. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, Sylvia, that was so good to hear all about everything that you've been doing. Really, yeah, so like like tiny taste of what you're doing. And yeah. Um, I was curious to understand a bit more about the holistic grazing. I didn't quite catch um, whether it had been successful in your or context not. or not. Yeah. Um, yeah, I can I don't think I can give a really straightforward question, but basically um, the analysis that was done. The cows were grazing for two months, uh, April till June. And then the study was done in September and analyzing basically soil litter, uh, decomposition rate, nutrient cycling, water infiltration, um, cap capacity of the soil to recover from erosion events. And um, it seemed that it didn't really bring a positive result. But also thinking that it was compared with area that were not grazed, but also where the grasses were not cut, where nothing was done. So they were left uh, completely unmanaged in a way. Uh, and then, of course, if you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because those areas had a thick layer of vegetation that stayed there throughout the whole summer, like mulch, basically, and the grazed areas didn't. Um, so in terms of nutrient cycling and uh, basically capacity of the soil to recover after erosion and all of these factors, in September, so after the summer, it seemed like it hasn't been, it hadn't been a successful experiment. Um, so the idea that we have is that one thing could be doing it in a different season. Um, so just before the rains, uh, so then you leave the ground cover in summer and then you have um, cows grazing, the rain's coming, you can sow uh, new cover crops right after and then you have the manure and the rain and that should actually give a boost to the system. Um, so that was one idea or that we didn't do it the right way. So we let the cows stay for too long in, in some places um, and uh, also in some areas they stayed while it was raining or right after the rains, so maybe the soil was too soft and they compacted it, could be many things. But the way we did it, exactly the way we did it, wasn't great. <laughs> so now we know. <laughs> That's also a wonderful insight. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm really curious to hear what will uh, come from it because, I mean, that's the whole thing about the ecosystem restoration camps movement as a a global living lab that you experiment with this and we'll see what comes next and that's what's really exciting so i'm looking forward to hearing yeah yeah us too um Toxley, would you like to ask your question if you will otherwise we will go over to another question that Peter has asked before in the chat, um, do you think the ponds are less full even after a year with rain, less full? Uh, full, yeah, even after a year with rain because of the increased permeability of the soil. That's also something we, I, I'd like to think that's part of the reason, but I'm not sure uh, because actually 
the area of camp where there's definitely a higher infiltration in the soil. It's in a way very small part of the surface runoff that ends up in the in the in the pond. There's a very big part that comes from a road and in another almond field, which is um, plowed quite often, so it's very bare soil. Um, so it might be that partially it's because of that. Um, but yeah, I think the reason is indeed that uh, there hasn't been a very big rainfall. So then all the rainfall that we had was in, in, in small amounts and it first infiltrated in the soil rather than overflowing and running off and ending up in the ponds. That's, I think, most possible. All right, thanks. Tuxley, can you hear us if you still have your question and go for it? Otherwise, I will lower the hand in a bit. I saw another question in the chat from Louise Fett. Uh, is there any financial support from the Spanish government? Um, not that we are receiving at the moment, but for example, we're looking into um, having my wage covered through what is called Emplea Verde. So it's um, a financing from, from, the, from the region, actually, the, the, the region of Murcia where we're located. Uh, to support work in agriculture areas, rural environment, uh, young people, women, all these like more, how do you say, marginated uh, groups. Um, so that's one option that we're looking into. All right. I see uh, that. Can I ask uh, something else? Yes. Yes. Related to this. Hi. Uh, yeah. Great result and compliments for 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 doing all this. You, <laughs> of course, Sylvia. But uh, I was just wondering, don't, can't you sort of make advertisement within Spain, like Common Lands doing as well, or in The Guardian or whatever, as a, something like, you know, you're, you're doing that in public, or public interest. You, you must work on that as well, which of course is difficult when you have to run the whole show yourself. But I think it would be really possible to, to get more attention from people that find this very interesting to see the before and after, yeah, it's so impressive always, uh, so that you could have more support, more financial support, and you know, just being able to expand also. So, you know, is, is there a possibility, or maybe even with Willem Verbeda through Common Land, or I don't know, but I, th I think it's worth it. So if it doesn't come from the local government, maybe from, I don't know, some mecenas in Spain or... <laughs> okay. No, you're, yeah, you're absolutely right. There's definitely more more work that can be done on the side. Already, um, yeah, just being an ecosystem restoration camp, so through the foundation, we receive a lot of support. And um, also, the, the indeed, the voice goes out there and there's a... Um, that helps a lot. Um, yeah, there's, we are in touch every once in a while, people contact and they're like, oh, we're, uh, we're putting in touch uh, funders and, and projects and people that want to give money to plant trees or uh, big companies that are interested in financing this type of projects. So indeed, as you say, there is a lot of interest in that. Um, I am, yeah, we, I, I've started looking into all these possibilities maybe six months ago or a bit more. Um, so yeah, hopefully, at some point, I, I'll find the, the right directions and yeah. Yeah, it's also important that you can handle it eh, when it does come in and that's, that's takes yes. logistics Indeed. well. So, but then possibly you can ha hire more pe people. Exactly. And then it makes life easier, I would say. Yeah. A related question, if I can, Inge, uh, is uh, you're such a young people, great. So you know we with uh, for example wwf in colombia they're also working with influencers that could be of help <laughs> that are willing to you know that are really thinking about this is it this is what it should be or whatever or so i was thinking you know are, are there people that you could you know yeah 
I don't know, ask them to make some advertisement for this great movement. Don't you? Yeah, know? actually, as I mentioned, Gabri, one of the volunteers, the, the one that has been here the longest. Um, so the project he has with two other friends is about communication, about regenerative practices on, on Instagram. They're now making uh, videos and, and a lot of different things. And they are a bit more in that sense, working with the influencer type of idea and uh, sharing things that happen on the farm at camp. And so maybe they are, maybe they're the ones that are going to bring in those, that different channel. John is waving. I don't know why John's waving. He wants to, he wants I think to, he wants to say something. <laughs> I'm going to shut up. Okay. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't, don't. My, my, what I would like to suggest is that uh, Sylvia gets Luis Vett's contact information and asks her to become uh, an ambassador for C Camp Altiplano. She's a very important person in the Netherlands. And I think she is a, a great influencer and I think it would be wonderful to have this connection. Yeah, but I'm not, I'm not, yes, I support, but I'm not the influencer that I'm talking about. <laughs> these are, these are the people with millions of followers then and, and lots of money. So that would be, that would be, you know, something like, a, you, I don't you know. Meet them. You meet them. So yeah, yeah. I think it's, I think it's a very good idea. This is because the, the influencers with lots of money, they listen to Louise. No, so, sometimes. Yes. They do. <laughs> so, this, this is, I think, the, the exact thing, because I think the young people have to, to take sovereignty. You have to act. You can't wait. You can't give the, the, the um, power to people who have who are in the status quo and who have money but you can work with them if they choose to work with you so the the key thing is keep going because the more you do the more obvious your 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 courage and your determination is and it will pay off yeah yeah i'm sure you can well, well, we'll see what I can do. This, this is a very good motivating session. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I was already telling John, who's been, of course, one of the most influential, the biggest influencer, John, I mean, with your film and John and the lessons from Los Plateau and that kind of thing. It, 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 I use it in lectures as well, and it, it's so impressive. But this is you know, then you kind of preach for the converted already. Yeah? And, in a, yeah. in, and what we need to do is to find somebody that is totally beyond, but that is just grasped by the idea. And then that they really want to, to help. Now, of course, yeah. I try with some people like DOB Ecology in the Netherlands, for example, or, but I really mean somebody out of the, you know, out of our holistic bubble, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's much more influential, uh, and and some people in this world have too much money; they have no idea what to do with it. So as long as they can, they can feel good about it. That would even be best, you know. Even if it's not huge amounts of money, but something that you could actually do. And another suggestion I had is um, a, 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 Tom Crowder from the. ETH lab in Zurich. He was a postdoc in our lab. And uh, Tom Crowder, look at the Crowder lab. They work on soil, they work mm -hmm. on mapping. They, they're looking always for people to work with them. They do a lot of citizen science type of work. Um, so I, I would try to see if you can connect up. Have a look at the Crowder lab website. It's very interesting to see they're working together with the World Resource Institute. They're funded by DOB Ecology, but also by big mecenas in, in, in the United States. And they work with Google and blah, blah, blah. He, he's very much- yeah, I think uh, the foundation is already working with them, right? That's, that's correct. We, we're partnering <laughs> yep. with them. Oh, all right. the camps. All the camps are going to be integrated into their restore platform, which should restore. really help. Okay, excellent. A lot of things. Yeah. They had a great idea because it's already happening. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I didn't know that. 
<laughs> I don't get any really updates, but uh... there's, there's okay. One of the... Now, there's one look, of the... Tom, Tom knows a lot of influencers as well, I'm sure. <laughs> so just basically be blunt and ask him, say you need some more money because you need to hire a few people and if he can get, if he can sort of do it for you. All right, we're going to go for it. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other thing I should say. I, I'm in Los Angeles, um, trapped by the COVID travel restrictions. Accidentally, I was supposed to give some speeches out here. And then everything, I was here in, in late March and everything, uh, 2020, and then everything shut down. So I got stuck in California and I was very fortunate to be uh, taken care of by lots of interesting people. And we, we started to communicate with the type of group that you're talking about, entrepreneurs. And so the Silicon Valley entrepreneurs and Hollywood. So these two things are, are emerging. And of course, strangely, I, I also found that California has a lot of its own problems with large numbers of homeless and, and at the same time, the ridiculous affluence and then, and then abject poverty. So it was quite tragic to see that. And, uh, but um, this is ending up by finding two ways that California could use restoration because they're, ex they're experiencing extreme drought and wildfires and this is essentially it seems to me after observing this now for some time early stage desertification because they have removed 95 to 97 percent of the great coastal forests and you can't do that without having serious consequences to the hydrological function and so just explaining that to them, they're shocked to hear these kinds of things, but th that's the reality. And so there are a number of groups in advertising and in media and in, in, um, in entrepreneurial like uh, venture capital and so on. So this is, this is being discussed, but what I find, Luis, is that it's not a very good idea to pursue these people. It's best if they come to me <laughs> or, you know, if, if they, if, so that for, for me, I can't spend my time on people who just, you know, have demands or something about what they would like to see. What I want to do is just keep doing what I do because that's what I have, I have control over. And then those people who come to me and they say, well, we want to support, we want to help. They're the only ones I've ever seen actually give money. So yeah, but that's, that's also the group I mean. I mean, yeah. it's just but, that they can be grasped by the idea when they see it. Yeah. And that's what you can use uh, to persuade them to be involved, but they're, <clears throat> they're not going to demand anything in no way. Yeah. They're just going to support. That's and, good. And be proud of that because they they can, you know. Let that me would, add you know. let me add one more thing. We're we're looking at what you what you wrote to me about uh, documenting these things. I've come to uh, another conclusion. It's wonderful that there's this vast body of material that I've made over the, long, the last few decades because I can see that it's being used in universities and in schools and, and uh, it's, it's very influential. But what I think is now necessary is to continuously introduce, define and, and reinforce because what we see is in science and in policy most of the things that I've been saying for almost three decades have already been incorporated into science and into policy, but into action is another, another thing. So what, what I think we're, we're looking at from a media perspective, the, much of the media world is in a very strange state where there is uh, 
very high levels of manipulation of the viewer. So if you study the thoughts of Noam Chomsky for manufacturing consent, or if you look at what's happening with the political messaging, and uh, I mean, it's 1984, uh, it's, it's terrifying what, what's going on with this. So, the, but, but it's actually not the media, it's not the technology, it's the people who are guilty of using this in a bad way. So the, the best case, I think, is, and what, what's being discussed now is to create a, a series of programs, which is not so much like a science documentary. It's more like creating collective consciousness. It's about, it's about talking about ideas that are unassailable. So when you, when you introduce concepts about evolutionary succession and you talk about what this means, that, that the processes which we depend on for life come from these, these, these processes, there's no way you can argue the other side. If you, if you start to argue, no, we don't need soil fertility, or we don't need water, or we don't need biodiversity, it's ridiculous, you know. So, so everybody should argue from, from the point of biodiversity, biomass, and accumulated organic matter, because it can't, it, you know, you, you can't take the other side. But the fact, is, the fact is that people are focused on things on buying and selling things. And so they, they're valuing these things higher than the life systems. And that's wrong, that's just a mistake. And so in order to get to the point where people are focused on what's real, we need to have a continuing conversation and more and more people need to, to present this. So that's what I'm trying to do now is create this series where voices from many, many people from around the world can contribute to this concept. Maybe certainly first every month and then maybe every week, just constantly create this conversation because the more this conversation ripples out, now I can see this from my own work, which I, I would say is, you know, it's a small step, but what happened was when it was presented, nobody noticed, sort of, in the beginning, but then gradually more people noticed and more people noticed and more people noticed, so it, it starts to grow. So this is what we can do now, is grow that sort of amplification of this message. And that's, that's, that's what I'm thinking. So I'm, if, you're, if you're keen to work on that, Luis, let's do it. <laughs> um, uh, we have here in Hollywood and in in California many interesting characters who do want to do this. So it, it is moving in this direction. Thank you, John, and thank you, Louise, also for the energy and the uh, possibilities for uh, Sylvia. Maybe it's good to have a discussion about it, John. Uh, but there are still some uh, questions for Sylvia. Um, one second, uh, Tuxley still has some questions. Her mic didn't work. So her, um, her or I don't know if it's a he or a she, excuse me for that. Um, she was, he or she is wondering about the natural history of the land, uh, the hills look bare too. Um, I guess of the area surrounding camp, um, there's, Good reasons to believe that this area was uh, a part of it, at least, has been forest in the past. Uh, we have a forest on the land here, so it also, even if not the whole area was forest, but it's still possible. And since Roman times, logging, um, grazing, overgrazing um, has been taking down most of the forest, uh, and that creates a, a basically a, a downward spiral which is reinforcing itself you don't have trees you don't have roots you don't have uh anything able to keep the soil in and there goes the the degeneration let's say of the landscape so indeed the hills where we've been working on with it with reforestation which is now as cropland and uh, 
doesn't mean there's nothing there. There's loads of interesting thing and and and, and native species and actually some um, botanists from the region found a very rare species in one of in one of those I cannot remember the name, but in one of these uh, bear hills. Um, so basically, it's a uh, land that has been degraded, and we're trying to bring it back to a state of uh, climax vegetation, if that answered the question. Thank you. Um, Taxi is also wondering um, that the almond trees are grown without water except swales. In California, they are very, they are a very intensive crop and are the black locust trees coppicite. Yeah, so um, like all dryland crops, you can you can also grow them uh, with irrigation, and they would just do better. Um, but here, it's always been a, a rain-fed area. There's no irrigation. There's only a very tiny part of the farm that has irrigation. So all the crops that grow here, uh, the grains, the almonds, the pistachios, everything is only rain-fed. Um, so they do release. They are adapted, and especially it's uh, local species that we use local varieties um, so they don't definitely don't need uh, extra irrigation you you would actually well if you don't have a well-drained soil you can actually have more losses from water logging rather than drought apparently thanks um michael polarski you have another question you are you are muted Since I just saw Majed show up here, Majed, did you get my those shipment of books I sent you? Did that ever happen? Yes, thank you. They arrived. They are in Germany, and I'm waiting uh, the first one coming from Germany to bring them. But they are in a safe place, and thank you, really, really, I appreciate. Oh, good. Well, I'm glad to hear they arrived. It was you know, yeah. uh, thank oh, you. that's around the way at any rate. So. Um, Maybe I could do that for more camps. I collect books on useful books. Um, this, this is great. So I had a, a larger comment and then a more uh, pointed question for Sylvia. The larger comment is that the world is awash in money and funds, but uh, there needs to be the, as John said, the uh, collective consciousness that uh, that we need to use it for restoration instead of rich people getting richer. So how to change, we need money reform, financial reform in the world on a very large scale. And I don't know how to do that, but Me neither. <laughs> history shows <laughs> that eventually that uh, things give and, um, and things will change. And I don't know what form that will take. But in the meantime, I'm curious if, if Altiplano is getting funds from ecosystem restoration camps to help with the finances. It sounds like your salary is covered by the, by the government and then the people are paying to be there. Is there funds coming? How much does ERC contribute? So actually at the moment, we, uh, my salary is covered by the foundation, by ERC. Uh, and this is going to be the last year that we're receiving this funding, that's why we're looking into the other option, like having my salary covered by the government. Um, so, and yeah, we are this year, for example, we're going to receive um, 12,000 euros, uh, possibly, possibly 24. Let's see how things go. And indeed with this, um, that's why we're looking for the other options. Um, we have spent, if I'm not wrong, like ideally if to, to run the project, have one person running it, the buildings that are where the infrastructure, which is working, the plants, the trees. Um, I think it would be more or less a 40,000 euros a year. Um, more or less, maybe depending also on, for example, now, because we've been finishing all of the infrastructure, which is not completely 
finished yet, but the biggest part has been done. So there has been in the past few years, a lot of money going into that. So hopefully it would be less money on that and possibly indeed more on expanding or working with other farms or uh, just doing more land focused activities. Shall I help you with that answer too, Sylvia? Yes, please. <laughs> So, Michael, uh, in the past few years, I think a couple of hundreds of thousands of euros went from the ERC Foundation to this camp. And this is this camp now has uh, its infrastructure in place and is able to receive people. And uh, many of what we call volunteers, but it's a sort of a, we call them campers now, because people associate volunteers with people who come and just bring their labor. They, they are willing to pay for their lodging and part of the project too while they're there. So it's part of the... We hope last year funding model for ERC Altiplano, and we, we went there, Jan Hein and I, and talked to Alfonso and Sylvia and did the math, and it looked like it would work, and then COVID came. Uh, so we are still supporting Altiplano because it's the first camp, uh, and uh, you can't let that go. So uh, we'll, we'll continue to be there. But we hope that the camp model in Altiplano proves that it can finance itself because that's when you can go to hundreds of camps around the world. And this would be the, the leading example that shows how that could work. So let's hope COVID disappears very soon. It won't, but at least becomes manageable and uh, that it can start to do that because that will stimulate others to step on and get going because it can fund itself. That's our hope. Okay. Yeah, mine too. <laughs> Yeah, well, thank you for that explanation. That that helps my head. But um, I just want to announce to John and to the group, I, I am putting on a 10-day drylands permaculture course uh, in October here in West, for Western United States, particularly. It's an uh, in-person course. Out of that, I hope will come an online course that we can get people from around the uh, uh, drylands around the world, hopefully, uh, can can step in, including ERC people. So anyway, I'm working on this drylands permaculture course and wanted John to know that. And if anybody here in the Western US, they might contact me at Friends of the Trees. Thank okay. you, Michael. All right, uh, Maket. Maket is actually from Camp Abiba. So hello, good to see you. Hello. Uh, you are doing a great job. Thank you really for what you are doing and your inspiration for us to follow your uh, Altoblano camp. Uh, my question to you, uh, is that possible to try the Moringa trees over there? Uh, are they sensitive to frost? Because I think they are. No. They are sensitive to the frost, uh, but when it is in summer, uh, I think they, are, they can work uh, good and they can feed your, uh, your cattle. They are, they are fast grower and they are yeah. very good in, uh, and you can use them for, uh, for food, for cattle. They are very but good. But then would they, would they survive through the winter? Because we have snow every year and many days of below it, it zero. If, okay, if they don't survive, at, at least for this uh, summer uh, months, you, you have them. And you, there is a lot of things that you can do with the, with the Moringa. And we use also as a, a good fertilizer, a part of it. So you mean they could be used also only during summer months and replanted? Yes, 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 yes. And you but then they would need water probably. They are resilient for, uh, for, for uh, water. And we make a lot of trials here and uh, really they are resilient and uh, they, uh, they can live without water for a long time. Nice. We will, maybe this summer we can try. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mariette. Good to see you, by the way. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. A, a question from the chat from Bart Dekat. Is there a danger of wildfires with increased biomass? Probably why Spanish farmers keep the biomass clean between the trees. Uh, that's also true. Um, I don't think that's the main reason for the, the way the ground is managed in, in these areas. Um, here specifically, in, in this farm, 
as far as I know, there's not a very high fire hazard. I mean, it, it could be in the sense that there is uh, really dry summers, but maybe possibly exactly because of that, there's little rainfall, there's little biomass, there's not much uh, wild vegetation growing. Uh, so it doesn't seem to be an extremely dangerous area. Um, but yeah, it is also part why farms are managing, clearing their land in, in, in certain areas of Mediterranean countries, definitely. On, on, a, on a larger scale, um, <clears throat> like uh, Monbiot describes well, uh, Europe was not uh, historically forested. It was a mixed uh, landscape with uh, empty areas uh, kept empty by herbivores. It's why in other uh, spaces in, in Spain and uh, rewilding Europe, they experiment with reintroducing herbivores, which are the main uh, fire brigades to prevent mass fires, which we noticed in other continents in, in Australia and California and so on. So, uh, uh, yes, it's a fantastic uh, camp and results and you create enormous biomass. But in Spain, as you know, in the three months extremely, you can see fire running over the ground with almost no biomass. So it's, it, it could be a, a danger in the future. So maybe experimenting that with the cattle will reduce the biomass and create open spaces which uh, are kind of natural uh, fire controls in the future. It, it's, it's just an idea. Yeah, yeah, that's a good thinking as well. If I could say something because California has been experiencing the fires um, quite a lot. And my understanding in Spain was that um, under Franco, they introduced plantation tree planting of Aleppo pine. And the Aleppo <clears throat> pine are really subject to actually exploding. They, they spontaneously combust at a certain temperature. So when, when the very, very hot temperatures happen, and maybe there's a lightning strike or something, and what happens then is that they explode and when they explode, they spread the fire further and further. And what's happening in California is an understanding from the indigenous people who for 15,000 years were tending the forests here is that they were using fire and that there are two types of fire. One type of fire is a, is a cool fire which burns through the undergrowth. And the second type of fire is a fire that rises up into the canopy and, and, and it, uh, it's, it's, it's enormously hot, it's different. So if you can understand these different things and understand how the moisture is at the surface of the, of the soil. So when the soil is completely dry and of course, especially when there is no vegetative cover, then the, the temperatures are highly uh, elevated. I would actually, asks Sylvia if measurements of surface temperatures could be taken in the camp, especially in control areas in the, in the, in the neighboring areas where there is no vegetation. If you can measure the surface temperatures where there is no vegetation at the same time of day, et cetera, and then study what you have changed and measure those temperatures, I think you'll find there are 10 to 15 degrees centigrade difference. And so this is, this is quite extraordinary for a number of things. It, when combined with the, the moisture uh, profiles, it should tell you quite a lot uh, about what is possible and what is not possible. And if you can multiply that, those influences, having moisture at the surface, having more relative humidity in the air, and having much lower surface temperatures, you get a completely different result. So that's one finding from looking at, at ecosystems around the world. Um, and I think that there, you have to conti continuously monitor and assess because there are various possible outcomes and we don't actually know what those outcomes will be. So you have to, you have to pursue monitoring that uh, 
it seems to me that in all the places I've seen that have high amounts of organic material, higher and higher canopies, and lower and lower surface temperatures, you get a much better result. I jump in right away on that, Inga. Yes, go before, for it. Before you, before you give the floor to Jonathan. Yes. Um, so what John just said, uh, John has the ideas. We at the Foundation tried to carry them out. We have a fundraiser going right now. I'm just going to blatantly ask for money or material. We are raising funds for data loggers, temperature data loggers, so that most of the camps can start measuring the temperatures between where they are and uh, control areas so that you can start showing those differences. Uh, if anyone here knows anyone that has a, a hundred of them lying around, let us know uh, because we'll be happy to take them if they don't know, they no longer need them. Or if you have, uh, know someone that can afford a hundred of those because they're about $70 each, that would be great too, because then we can buy them for the camps and they will start logging that, that temperature data et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if you go to our website, there's a link because we're also raising funds for penetrometers, scales, microwaves, and ovens to do all the soil testing and, and things that need to be done. But what John says, it's a, it's a great indicator measuring the temperature difference. It also tells people something is going on. Uh, but then we need to buy data loggers and they're, they're, these are not regular temperature gauges. These are just expensive things and you need multiple of them per camp. I, I think I would add something to that. Luis, Vet, I, and other scientists should look at the concept of having 50 different living laboratories all connected with data loggers, sending the data up to computers so that, that and, and those having the satellite images having the ability to have localized photography and the, all the data sets flowing into a central place, it, it, it very rapidly creates a, uh, a, a very serious network of data, and, which is very robust, much better than just say LIDAR from the satellites or something like that. And, um, I would also say in to, in to that earlier question and question of funding, if the numbers of people joining the ecosystem restoration camps movement as supporting members were to reach, let's say, one million, and they were each just sharing 10 euros per month, that would be 120 euros per member per year with a million that would be 120 million euros available to support camps. you know just imagine reaching a million members and i think that what's happening is that this this methodology of an in of an mass engagement of the population is so much more effective so much more real than having people go to conferences. I mean, they spend a hundred million to have conferences and talk about restoration. But what we see in, in this type of a organization is ordinary people with very small amounts of resources can actually do the work that needs to be done. So having the connection between the the theoretical overview and the scientific analysis and all of these living laboratories, this is the key to, to making this a global movement and making it very, very effective. So I think we have everything we need within this group to make it happen, but we just need to learn how do we work together. Yeah, Lu Louise, as John mentioned your name. <laughs> yeah, I have, oh God, I have to leave, but uh, we'll think about it. <laughs> thank you. All right, thank you, John, for sharing his word, for your words. And Peter, um, Jonathan from Camp Hotham has a question from uh, Sylvia. So I, 
Well, yeah. I'm not sure who this question is for. Um, we're currently working on a grant proposal for a funding innovation grant. It's a grant to partner with the National Forest on innovative funding projects for restoration. And the missing component is not the science and the scientific methodology. It really is the methodology for measuring the economic opportunities and how to encourage private investment and get out of this kind of nonprofit NGO mentality and also out of the mentality of kind of you know government agency appropriations funding and seeking investment capital um, for long-term investment in forest health and restoration. And so I would be really intrigued to hear from anybody who has connections with economic researchers in academic institutions who are interested in exploring um, you know, how to do a research project and potentially after we get done with this research project, which is where the forest service personnel that I've been in communication with have suggested we start instead of the pilot project, start with the research, um, doing research on this economic model so that it could then be scaled you know, across the globe with organizations like ecosystem restoration camps. So I'm looking for economic researchers um, from institutions, if you know of any. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan, for sharing. Is there anyone who knows someone or a university that is researching this? Or Jonathan, maybe it's a good idea if you drop your email address in the chat so people are able to reach out to you if, um, if someone knows anything. I think that's the best solution. Um, just, just the last few questions for um, Sylvia. Um, Margit, do you still have a question for Sylvia? You are you are muted. Okay. Okay. No, I don't. Uh, I don't have question for her, but uh, I'm just suggesting for the. You know, I agree for the data sharing, which is very important, and to be connected with the academia here in Habiba, for example, we are solving a lot of our problems, uh, connecting with the like now we have the center of excellence of water. So I have a lot of expertise and the universities that they are working on the, on the water issue, and then with other, with the ancient university. Uh, so I found the solution with the with the students with the, some uh, small uh, tools that we can make, and then as I mentioned uh, to everyone that we have now the artificial intelligence. This is will help a lot in uh, in measuring and uh, uh, accessibility, and then we have we found the solutions. So thank you. Thank you. That's wonderful news. Thank you, Margaret. Um. Stephen Bow. Yeah. Yeah, the question I had was just about water um, for, for people in the camps. Where's the water source coming from? And is there a sort of nature-based plant filtration system happening on the land? Um, we indeed, the biggest challenge was at, since the beginning that there's no water there. Um, there were thoughts about digging a well, uh, but then you're not sure you're gonna find water, how deep and where and what quality. Uh, so in the end, we, the idea was also to use the water of the ponds at least for irrigation. Um, it turned out to be too salty, at least the moment in which it was uh, studied by a student who was here doing an internship with the, the program of the Regeneration Academy, which is another project here at the farm. Um, so now we're actually using that water for irrigation. Uh, we're going to measure the salinity and as long as it's doable, it's not, we're going to keep using it. So what we did now is indeed building this water deposit, um, which is a 35,000 liters deposit uh, out of concrete uh, on the land. And we're 
hauling the water from uh, the farm of La Junquera, which is four kilometers away. Uh, and here there is a natural spring. So it's uh, the water that reaches all the house. I'm, I'm living here and it, it's the water we drink, the water we use for all meat. Um, so at the moment, this is the water source that we have there. Um, and indeed the plan is, I'm looking now into putting gutters on all the buildings and having the rainwater as well. And then we'll have to think about filters. I would like one thing that I've been looking at this past few days also, it's indeed using filters to be able to use this water for drinking purposes uh, so that volunteers there can finally have all the basic needs covered. So also on this side, if anybody has um, advice, ideas on uh, what kind of water filters, why, what, and for what type of water, that, uh, that would be really nice. Yeah, there's a really um, interesting series on Apple Plus uh, where they're describing different homes in, in different places and how they're dealing with that. Um, in Sweden, there's a, a man who built a, a greenhouse that enclosed his log house and he created a kind of Mediterranean climate in Sweden. And then he created um, a kind of plant ecosystem that, that basically filters the water for him within his home. And um, it went through a process in that municipality where they weren't gonna let him use that, <laughs> that kind of system, but he proved that the water filtration worked way better than the, the, the municipal system. Um, and, really nice. Yeah, yeah. And um, the reason I bring that up is, is just recently I was listening to a podcast about a woman who just passed away in, in the Vancouver area, but she was heavily involved in landscape architecture. And a big part of what she was doing was using plant-based water filtration systems to purify the water so that they didn't even have to be connected to the, the local sewage treatment systems. And um, she got her technology from NASA because they were trying to figure out, well, what kind of ecosystem, what kind of plants do we need if we were gonna go into space and then like grow some plants and have some sort of water purification system in, in their spaceships, right? So they were, <laughs> were trying to figure out, well, so these are the kind of plants and, and um, the combinations of organisms that you would need. And, and the reason I got into that was just because there was a, a guy um, who won the, the living building challenge, uh, John Todd, who has this whole thing called living machines where he's, he's created the, the kind of um, technology you would need to, to basically purify the water so that, yeah, you have the right combination of plants, you'll, you'll have clean water in the end. Yeah, indeed, we're also thinking, for example, to be able to have better quality water in the ponds, uh, at least for irrigation, to build um, islands of, so floating islands of cork, mm -hmm. with, uh, which is something which is already existing, people are doing it, they're selling it, we would like to do our own. Floating islands of cork with plants uh, on it that can be plants that indeed absorb the salts or any other problem that we need to solve in the water. Um, we're just trying to find cork. It's really hard. If it's yeah. not the, the, the planks that you buy in, in the DIY shops, but just like untreated cork, mm -hmm. impossible to find. So, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think that that's indeed a... Because, for example, now with the gray waters of the kitchen, uh, we're just using uh, biodegradable products and, and, and nothing else. So it's going directly into the soil. There is a filter with mulch, basically, that it goes through, but nothing more than that. And it's already, uh, let's say, a very minimalistic, but it works. Um, so indeed, I think it would be great to work a bit more with these options. Yeah, yeah. I left uh, a bunch of links in the chat if you want to um, learn any resources on what I just mentioned. I, Thank, nice. you Thank you. I believe that uh, Maggot 
in um, in uh, Habiba camp in in the Sinai will be getting some support for creating some sort of uh, water through phytoremediation or other natural things. So that could be something that could be shared later on the designs and the and the and the functionality of this and that is john todd working together with the weather makers so i think that's going to be a, a very good thing great yeah thank you thank you for sharing us stephen and john um, we are already one hour and 45 minutes into this call i feel yeah, thank you all so much for all your questions, but I do feel it's it's a good um, time to, to end the Q&A session. Uh, if you are all, all right with, with that. Um, so I want to thank you all very much for joining this Q&A session and what an energy in this call. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. John, would you, would you like to stay for an, another open discussion or? Come to thank you. I can stay as long as anyone wants to stay, I guess. If, if people would like to stay for, for another open discussion with John, then feel free to stay. Otherwise, also feel free to, uh, to end this beautiful Q&A uh, session. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for joining everyone.